my uh, topic today is on epigenetics and neuroplasticity as it relates to your overall health, well-being, and vitality. I would like to um, start with the neuroplasticity first, and then I'll go to epigenetics, even though the title's got it in reverse, and um, build this. This has been a very significant topic in my research over the last many, many years. I taught neurology when I was in my 20s, so I've been studying this a long time. And um, in the 1970s and 80s, we were told that when you were conceived and born and developed, that pretty well the number of nerves in your body were stationary and they eventually died. So you had a gradually declining neurological, um, you might say, counting of nerves. And over time in the 1980s, 90s, and into 2000, they realized that neurogenesis occurred. That means new nerves were able to be formed, primarily in the hippocampus and certain regions of the brain that were involved in memory. And later they found out that this was occurring not just in those areas, but in many areas. And that was a real eye-opener because that meant that the brain could adapt and add new nerves. And that was a big insight. And then we started, they started looking exactly what caused that to occur. And they realized that if there was a motive for something, if you, you know, you've heard the statement, if you don't use it, you lose it. But if you do use it and it's useful, the brain will continue to develop. They later found out, um, as you can see in epigenetics and also in, in um, the telomeres dealing with stress, that if you reduce your stress levels or distress levels, and increase telomerase, you add telomeres to the genes and can live longer. And just like they realized that then genes were kind of uh, modifiable, and then they realized later with epigenetics, they can modify the genes. They realized the nerves can be doing that. And epigenetics were actually involved in the, the decisions of whether to stimulate new nerves, et cetera. And even though there's about a one nerve for every glial cell in the brain, glial cells are, are um, met glue originally, but they're just as functional, in fact, more functional than even the nerves. And the, the glial cells are involved in remodeling the brain, helping in the remodeling. They actually involved in uh, myelinating the brain, demyelinating the brain, neurogenesis, apoptosis, which is a cell death and cell birth, um, neurogenesis is cell birth and apoptosis is cell death. And they're absorbing and rebuilding. And so they realize that the nervous system was remodeling. It didn't have build without destroy, it didn't have destroy without build, that the involvement of the brain to adapt to an ever-changing environment that was perceptual was a remodeling of the brain. And they found out that even people that had a bipolar condition and schizophrenia, where they had prefrontal cortexes that had been demyelinated and were losing neurons and dying, they found out if all of a sudden they changed it with therapy, they changed it and had those individuals doing something deeply meaningful and inspiring to them and living more high values uh, and neutralizing some of the impulses and instincts that polarized them, they can actually remodel the brain and bring back literally neuroplastically um, the brain development and the forebrain was able to be developed again. And, the, and therefore the idea that you take a scan, a functional MRI, for instance, on a person with schizophrenia or something, and you say, well, that's the reason for it. Uh, instead of it being causal, and now it's really correlated with the how you use your brain. And that's inspiring because that means that if you manage your brain more effectively, manage your life more effectively, you can develop the forebrain and keep it active and keep it growing and keep it growing new nerves <clears throat> and epigenetically modify it and actually remodel the brain. They also found brains sometimes with missing parts, uh, completely missing cerebellums. Uh, which is a coordination and balancing portion of the brain. And they had balance and coordination, relatively speaking, and they found out that other parts of the brain were taking on that. And a whole new field was being developed where they could, the person would cut out their eyesight, but their tactile and smell would go up. And now they've even crossed it from sensory over to motor. They now realize that if you actually have eyesight that's diminished, uh, you can actually develop a tactile feel and get a sense that will actually give 
visual neurons that are normally firing from the visual cortex activation and you can see without actually seeing <laughs> in your mind at least so they realize now that the brain definitely has neuroplasticity and this is very inspiring because that means that no matter what's going on in your life no matter what you've been through it may not be really what determines what goes on in the brain you could actually take as i've been teaching in the breakthrough experience take a perception that you think is traumatic and revamp it and reassociate things with it and turn it into something that you're grateful for and move forward in your life and develop the executive center. And, and if you just stayed with the idea that that was a traumatic event, the executive center will demyelinate and lose neurons and the amygdala will grow. And then you'll end up with the hippocampus remembering that the more you dramatize that and play like a victim and your brain is rock, constantly modeling it which means that you have the capacity to change your brain at any time. And this is very, very inspiring and, and revolutionary com compared to what it was in the 70s and 60s. Uh, it used to be that if you found a thing, you blamed that and that was the cause. Now you realize it's not what goes on an outside, it's your perception of it, decision on it. And I'm gonna come back to that on epigenetics in a moment. So there's a rule that if you, um, it's called he Hebbian rule or Heb rule, uh, that if you, two nerves that happen to fire together, wire together. So that means if you take, like we do in the breakthrough experience, an event that you perceive uh, challenging, uh, terrible, and you ask, so what's the benefits of it? And stack up benefits on it. You take new associations, path, increase new pathways in the brain, and the stimulus, instead of a stimulus response with withdrawal and pain and suffering, you now associate new benefits with it and your brain says, oh, great, I use that and now you're resourceful. So this is very powerful. You can also take things you're infatuated with and stack up the downsides to it and break your hook that keeps making go into the same re regurgent to, to the same recycling process of relationship pathways. I mean, I know a woman that had gotten married to five mics, all alcoholics, five marriages with alcoholics to mics. Uh, father's name was Mike, was an alcoholic that she resented. So she ended up keep repeating that. So we can actually take those things we, we infatuate with and seek that can hook us. And we can take those things that we resent and hook us. And we can redo those, change our whole pathway, change the, the reflexes and conditions in the brain and take command and direct it in the direction we want to go. So the brain is basically remodeling itself constantly according to how you feel your day in your perceptions and your actions. So they uh, a very simple in Benson's law, you can take a, an action and repeat playing the guitar or playing the violin or something like that and become more masterful and it becomes autonomic and habitual. And you myelinate the brain and replastic the brain and that area of the brain will grow. And the areas that you're not using will die out because your body uses glucose and oxygen most effectively. It doesn't want to waste energy on something that's not needed. So if you don't use it, you lose it. And if you use it, it grows. And that means you can grow your brain and develop your brain in any capacity you want and take command of it. And this is uh, a fantastic science confirming what I've been sharing for many, many years, that uh, if your innermost dominant thought can become your outermost tangible reality, you can think about how you want it, be solution oriented instead of problem oriented and come up with solutions and not problem or problems. If you dwell on your problems, you're going to get more problems. You dwell on your solutions, you get more solutions, as they say. So the beauty of neuroplasticity is that the brain is plastic. It's remodelable. It's not set in stone. It's building and destroying. It's creating new pathways, new branches, new spines on the dendrites, new axon directions. It's new synapses. It's uh, it, it, with epigenetics, it's literally modifying the genes. Uh, inside. I mean, it is just amazing what we can do. And so I tell people, and I've been saying it almost all my weekly seminars, if you fill your day with high priority actions that inspire you, your day won't fill up with low priority distractions that don't. If you fill your day with high priority actions that inspire you, you will spot, you will at, re, decide and act on things more efficiently. So and that's not a pod. I'm not saying positive thinking. I'm saying inspired and there's a difference positive thinking can set up a fantasy and negative thinking can set up a nightmare but inspired thinking is a willingness to embrace both pleasure and pain the positive and negative in the pursuit of something deeply meaningful 
and pursuing meaning is what distinguishes us from the other animals. You know, any animal can go after avoid pain, seek pleasure and be hedonistic. And any human can be that also. But the search for that is an addictive behavior in many cases, but a meaningful pursuit that truly is inspiring to you, a why behind what you do is very important in life. So if you give yourself permission to go after and fill your day with things that are really deeply meaningful, what your voids and values in your life are directing you towards, a thing that you spontaneously are inspired to do, your brain will maximize its effectiveness in giving you the outcome. It will literally neuroplastically remodel itself down all the way down to the genes and the epigenes and epitags. It will modify itself to help you master your life and get what you want in life. So this is the magnificence of neuroplasticity. It's really amazing. Um, there's been stories of people that uh, were, like I said, blind, and they took another sense, and they started linking uh, previous memories of when they were seeing uh, two other sensations and activating old neural pathways to see from other senses. And so that once they link those, if you saw something, you could attach uh, uh, an idea of what you once saw there and reactivate that. And you actually will see it in your mind, even though your eyes won't see it, your eyes will, the pathways will do it. Just like they have phantom limb pain. You uh, could have an arm that's amputated, but your brain will actually feel that there's your fingertips of an arm that you once had have pain. I studied phantom pain and referred pains like that um, and it's really quite amazing. I studied referred pains extensively when I was in my uh, professional school. And um, we, we found reflexes in the body that could cause a person to have pain in a completely area, different area of the body because of the way the brain is set up. And if we associate new things with that pain, um, that sensation changes. So the, both the neurological sensory and motor effects and all the inner neurons in the brain are all remodifiable. And you can, you can do amazing things with it. And I, I couldn't develop that today on this little class here, but I mean, I could go probably for hours on just that. And uh, so neuroplasticity is the ability your, for your brain to build and destroy and remodel itself and create new synaptic pathways and get rid of old synaptic pathways to help you maximize your potential in your life. And the limits on that, we really don't know yet. It just keeps expanding as we go. The research keeps pointing to the idea that nothing's set in stone and we have the capacity to do more. So just because somebody has a deficit doesn't mean that they can't reactivate some of those deficits. And I think in the next five or 10, 20 years, we're gonna discover more and more and more and things that we once thought we couldn't do anything about, now we'll be able to do. So that's very inspiring. And I just want you to know that that lets you know that your potential is greater than you may have ever thought and maybe our belief systems about neurology in the past were part of the reasons why we're limiting our potential. And so as we grow and expand our awareness potential, knowledge-wise in, in our neurology, we also get to understand that we're capable of doing more. I really don't know what those limits are, as I said. So neuroplasticity is amazing. Uh, you literally, and, and what's interesting is if you change your perception, when you do the Demartini method, and you actually ask a new set of questions and become conscious of the unconscious information that you overlooked at the moment that you perceive something, and then all of a sudden see it in one two hundredth of a second or milliseconds, you literally have dendrites start to form spines on the dendrites, which are the receiving ends of the nerves. New synapses are starting to grow. New pathways are opening up. Neurogenesis starting. Myelinization is occurring. These are happening bang like that. So it's not something that takes necessarily months or years to restart, start to modifying. It happens in billions of seconds almost, or millions of seconds. <clears throat> so neuroplasticity is, is a skyrocketing new field that uh, is going to give us solutions to so-called problems. And we realize how powerful our mind is. Our innermost dominant thought does in fact our outermost tangible reality. Now let's tie that to epigenetics now because that's an important component too. Epigenetics means, epi means upon, on top of, in addition to, et cetera. And uh, I first got involved in epigenetics when I studied genetics. And um, obviously, because we're fascinated by um, a, when a sperm and an egg unite during the procreation process, you get a zygote, single cell uh, that forms. 
half the genes from the mother and half from the father. What happens is that zygote divides and divides and divides around 50 52 times until you get to the 7 trillion cells that you have in your body. And every time it divides, the cell that comes out of it is slightly modified. The genes were supposedly thought to be the same because when we, we study the genes of all those cells, they seem to be basically the same, but yet they were different cells. So how could a cell be different even though it comes from the same gene? That's interesting. Well, what they found out is that there were a stem stemming where types of cells would differentiate and cause a different type of cell. For instance, ectoderm cells can make nerves and skin and mesoderm cells can make bones and blood vessel systems. And endoderm can make uh, various organs and internal digestive uh, skins, you know, the in lining of the intestine. So that means when they can differentiate somehow to make a different type of cell, something has to happen because the genes are the same, but there's something else that's going on. And they found that there were signal molecules being released from a cell that was going to the cell wall of another cell and causing changes uh, and activating a cascading of enzymes and various impacts, eventually causing epi mutations, uh, a change in the expression of the genes, even though the genes were the same, an expression of the genes changed. And that's how you could have all the different types of cells, skin cells, hair cells, bone cells, et cetera, by the time you're born, even though they have theoretically the same genes. Now, although there's some mosaicism and there's some individual genomes inside the cells, or not genomes, but individual gene, genes, and the cells are slightly modified, they found now in some people, overall, the scheme is that you're basically the same genes through the body, but the epigenes, epigenetics is actually uh, altering this in the expression. And now with the epigenetics, they're finding out that not only is epigenetics occurring during gestation, the nine months of development, but now they're finding out that epigenetics in a parent of the father and the mother, the tagging of those genes are now passed down into the sperm and the egg and carried forward. And this is amazing. It's a multi-generational epigenetic mutations. And so what happens is if a father, for instance, is, is perceiving a trauma or something highly distressed, and it causes the sympathetic nervous system to be activated, a fight or flight response activates a neurotransmitter like cortisol or norepinephrine, epinephrine, or testosterone, and it's a fight response. It can methylate and leave methylations on the histones, which are the little eight proteins sitting in the genome, uh, around the genome that the genes are wrapped around, or on the genes themselves and cause a restriction or a stopping of the transcription of pro the, the genes into to RNA and into protein. So in other words, we can stop or start or inhibit or facilitate the expression of certain genes epigenetically based on perceptions of elation or depression or happy or sad or positive, negative, whatever you're perceiving out there is epigenetically affecting the genes. And this not only occurs in, in, in uh, cells other than the nervous system, but in the nervous system or brain. So in other words, if you have uh, a parent that was really highly distressed, a father, let's say, very stressed and had a major fight with somebody and never got over it, and then procreated uh, shortly after that and had that stored in the subconscious mind as a wound, then that's an epigenetic tag onto its brain and its cells and its genome. And then that can go into the sperm and the sperm can then go in and unite with the mother and the two together. And they found out now in mammals and in humans that uh, we won't even procreate if we don't have epigenetic tags. So the mother's and father's tags from their emotions is passed down like an inheritance of acquired characteristics, like a market said, that carried that down into the next generation. And so we're literally passing memes, which are our perceptions down through in addition to the genes. We call it genes and meme transmission. And what's interesting is we're actually getting that information carried down. And then how we interpret our own life, we can actually allow that to run our life, be victims of that. Or we can actually take those same experiences that are triggering those responses and neutralize those with the Demartini method at the breakthrough experience, where you can actually neutralize that and break those tags and, and remove those epigenetic tags. Because some of those epigenetic tags are are removed. In fact, we found out that in, in, in mice, which is an interesting one, and in mice, if the, the female mice mate with the ma male mice, 
and um, it's with a male mice that it really wants and likes, it will accept those genetic tags. If it's resenting and it has a withdrawal from it, but there's nobody else to mate with and it's in its cycle and it has a mate it's, that it's, and it's withdrawn from, it will actually remove some of those tags to try to make those tags less influential. So we realize that we can in the next generation uh, take on or overrule those tags. And that's amazing, which means again, we have this amazing capacity to take no matter what's happened to us and turn it into an opportunity. With neuroplasticity and the epigenetics, we can modify whatever happens in our life uh, and turn it into something fantastic. This is the reason why I, I spend so much time at the Breakthrough Experience going over the Demartini method and making sure that people learn how to do it. Because if they really comprehended what this thing can do, they would be mastering it because they can alter their neuroplasticity and alter their epigenetics by changing their perceptions and attitudes of mind. This is what William James and Wilhelm Wundt said in psychology over 100 years ago, that we have the capacity not to be a victim of our history, but to be a master of our destiny. So what's interesting is that these epigenetics, uh, literally what happens is the when you perceive something, let's let's just use it this way. I'll try to hold my hand so we can see it. If you perceive something that challenges you, uh, that oct activates the sympathetic nervous system, the fight or flight response. That activates cortisol, norepinephrine, epinephrine, testosterone, and those transmitters go into the vascular system, go through the, the circulatory system, go to a cell wall, attached to a cell. Um, when it attached to a cell, it literally activates a, a a second messenger, which is called cyclic uh, AMP, cyclic AMP, uh, cyclase uh, mechanism. What happens is it activates calmodulin, it lets calcium go in, it takes the cell wall, modifies the cell wall, makes the permeability change. It causes a series of enzymes called kinase enzymes to occur. It phosphatizes certain uh, chemistries. It then causes a methylation on the histones. Uh, and the, the DNA to make sure that it wraps tighter, the DNA around it, so it can't be transcribed because when you're in fight or flight, the genes are shut down. Uh, and what's happening is the materials from the gene, the genes themselves uh, are taken by kinesin molecules and transported the materials, all those biomolecules and materials are transported out to the cell wall to protect the cell wall from defense. Just like if you're in a in an old 19th or 18th century or 17th century village and somebody comes to attack, everybody leaves the feast and the, and the, the procreation and goes out to the wall to defend itself. The cells actually do that. And what happens is it stops and shuts down certain chemistry, alters the cell. We create symptoms as a result of that. We register the symptoms as a, a reflection of the psychology perception we have. I've been specializing in applied physiology, don't know what those symptoms mean, but those symptoms give you an insight about how you perceive life. And those symptoms are epigenetically altered expressions of genes showing up in physiology. Now, if something over here comes along and something supports you, and you now have a rest and digest and a feed and breed parasympathetic activation, you get a counterbalancing uh, compromise opposite chemistry. You get uh, dopamine and serotonin and oxytocin and kephalons. And those chemistries go in there and they go to the cell wall the same way through the fluid systems. They go and activate cyclic GMP, calmodulin, and activate phosphatase, which is the counterbalancing to kinase. And they go in there to the genes and then through the nuclear pore and the nucleus of the, of the cell and activate the histones to unspool the DNA and the histones. And what happens is then it opens up and it transcribes and it creates a new uh, expression. And the materials come from the cell wall now by a dynein molecule and pull the materials into the genome. So there's mitotic division and there's growth. So one is anabolic, if there's parasympathetic, one is catabolic, one is for build, one is for destroy. And our perceptions are literally altering our cells, not only in the tissues of the body, but also in the brain. So we literally are remodeling our body. Neuroplasticity isn't the only thing. It's bioplasticity. Your osteo when you have challenge, you create osteoclasts, which destroy your bone. When you're supported, you create osteoblasts that build your bone. If you have an imbalance of those, you can create bone conditions, blastic or clastic conditions, even cancers. But if those are balanced, if you have a balanced of emotions, the, the epigenetics balances and the plasticity of your nervous system balances and, and moves into the forebrain, and allows you to have the most executive functions, the most governed behavior, less 
uh, animal-like, and your whole physiology changes. So your entire wellness, your entire vitality uh, is empowered by having a balanced mind. That's one of the reasons why in the breakthrough experience, I take whatever you're infatuated with or resent, and I ask you the other side, what you've been unkind. See, when you're infatuated, you're conscious of the upside, you're unconscious of the downside. When you're resentful, you're conscious of the downside and unconscious of the upside. So the Demartini method in the breakthrough experience is asking you the part you're unaware of. It's not that the information's not there, you've subjectively biased it with your perception when you're infatuated or resentful. And when you do, you move out of the executive brain and you go into the amygdala where you polarize it further and distort it further and get into vicious cycles that become highly emotive. And now you've got a hook where you're seeking or avoiding and the world around you is running you instead of you running you. But the moment I ask what was the unconscious and like intuitive questions to bring out the unconscious and allow you to see both sides and bring your mind back into balance, your epigenetics don't code it one way or the other. It releases those tags, those epi tags, those epi mutations, which are carried down memes and motions from parents. You free them. You get to live by your highest value because when you're balanced, you're in your executive function, your objective, and you become masterful oriented, self-governed, more inspired vision. You end up having a higher wellness quotient. You don't have to create symptoms. And the purpose of the symptoms were feedback mechanisms to let you know that you had an imbalanced perspective. And your epigenetics is working on your behalf to let you know whenever you're distorting your reality with infatuations, resentments. Because if you're infatuated with somebody, you're not seeing who they really are. You're seeing only the upsides and you're blind to the downsides. And same thing for resentment. You're not really seeing who they are. I mean, I'm sure you've had people that you've been infatuated with and days and weeks and months later, you found out they weren't who you thought. But you don't need days, weeks or months to learn that. You can ask that question on the spot and see it right there and be more wise. The longer it takes for you to see the side that you've been ignorant of, the denser you are because you're, you're, you're into black and white thinking instead of gray. And if, if, what's interesting is if you actually see both sides simultaneously, you're in your most objective state, most executive function, you're poised, you're present, you're empowered, you're not distracted, you're not impulsive or instinctual, which is animal-like, you're more angelic-like, and you're more inspired, and you're more grateful, because you see things, you, you see the hidden order in the apparent chaos, because it's chaos to be in highly infatuated or highly resentful. If you've been highly infatuated, it's hard to sleep at night. Can't you get it out of your mind? It's hard to sleep. You have sleep deprivation. If you're highly resentful, you also have sleep deprivation. But if you're poised and present and have reflective awareness and you're not uh, throwing your minds into imbalance like that, you're centered. You rest more effectively and your epigenetic coding systems release. And you free yourself up of the epi marks, the epi tags, the methylation or acetylations from the challenges and the supports, the, the things that make you. What's, what's interesting is they found out that um, when, when a, with the mice or whatever, when they all of a sudden have these epi marks, their perceptions in their life after they've inherited that, again, can overrule them. So that means that you can't blame things. Well, my grandmother was this way and that's why I'm this way. Or my father was this way and that's why. You can say that those are epigenetic marks, but they're not stationed. They're not permanent. If you choose to give power to the drama and blame, they stay there and then they run you and they become a self-fulfilling fulfilling prophecy. But if you go in there and neutralize whatever those things are in your own life, you can transform those tags. Those tags are removable. They're not fixed uh, like they were. And now they know that epigenetics can actually modify the arrangement of the DNA and cause transpositions and rearrangements. So we may be rediscovering in the future that the, the genes are not stationary after all. They're constantly evolving, which is why you can have a, a bacteria put into an environment and all of a sudden a few of them live and they're stronger and then they can modify and they can start secreting enzymes to counterbalance a toxic material that was designed to kill them. And then they're mutating, superbugs. And we have the same capacity. It's just not as quick as a superbug. We have the capacity to take whatever's happened in our life and turn it into an opportunity and use it and be fueled by it. And this is why this topic today is important, epigenetics and neuroplasticity, because the brain itself is undergoing epigenetic alterations in the pathway. 
So if you got something that you perceive as very, very traumatic and very, very challenging, and you don't see the benefits to it, not because it's not there, because you're unconscious of it and unwilling to look for it, then what's going to happen is there are certain parts of the brain that are going to shut down. They're going to demyelinate. They're going to die. You're going to lose those functions because you're not using them. But in the same time, if you go back, change your perception of them, those will recome back, rebuild, and it's neuroplastic. And that's the why, why it's so important to master your perceptions, your decisions, and your actions. Those are the three things you have control over in your life. If you prioritize your actions, your motor, motor nerves can be remodeled. If you prioritize your perceptions, your perceptions can be remodeled. And if you prioritize your decisions to do things that are inspiring to you, your interneurons and associations in your brain are completely remodeled. Our whole subconscious mind store all the lopsided perceptions. But the second we balance those all out, and take them one by one, which is what I do methodically in the breakthrough experience of the Demartini method, the moment we modify those things out and balance all those out, the subconscious mind and all those epigenetic codes are being released and you're back to being who you are, the authentic you. Because there's the authentic you and then there's the one that's basically exaggerating itself when it looks down on people or minimizing itself when it looks up at people. And those are where all the tags are. So all the epi mutations and all the tags are expressions of your personas and masks that you wear. But if you actually neutralize them with the Demartini method and the breakthrough and neutralize those out and get back to authenticity and are grateful and inspired and loving and certain and present and empowered and by your enthusiastically acting towards what's really important to you, you transform those epigenetic tags and get yourself back into your real expression of genes, your gene potential. So I just want to take a few moments to share something on neuroplasticity and epigenetics because they run our behavior and we can take command of them. So I just want to go over that because I just, it's inspiring. I, I've watched a video recently on, on something on epigenetics. It was just mind blowing about how we can transform. So I just want you to know that you have nothing on the outside. I've said this in my breakthrough experiences for 30 years some more plus, um, that nothing your mortal body can experience that your mortal soul can't love. And when you love things, you're in command. When you judge things and infatuate or resentful thing, to things, the external world runs your life. And the voice and the vision on the inside, when it's louder than all opinions and things on the outside, that's when you master your life. So please consider coming to the Breakthrough Experience and learning the Demartini Method to help you transform your epimutations and your epigenetics uh, and neutralize those tags that may be running your life today and get on with doing something that's authentic and inspiring to you. And to help you do that, just know that the greater your vision in life, the more resilient, adaptable, and authentic you'll be. If you're living and just living day to day and just surviving, you're not going to get the most out of your life. But if you have a thriving, inspired vision that you have a big enough reason to go after, a why big enough, then you will find solutions and strategies to go and do something extraordinary. To help you on that, I want to give you a little gift. There's a, a, an audio program called Awakening Your Astronomical Vision. And this is a special gift. It's worth about 50 bucks. We normally sell it. If you go to demartini.inc slash gift to reclaim it, I am absolutely certain that this, this little gift will be valuable. You watch it more than once, I promise you. It's a live presentation I did in a planetarium in Johannesburg to a series of YPO leaders of businesses. It's about giving yourself permission to have an astronomical vision to do something extraordinary on planet Earth. It was inspiring. It was well-received. I'm absolutely certain you will you will listen to it. I'm gonna, I, I talk about the, what impact it has by, by going after something that's inspiring to you in your life and filling your day with high priority actions. When you fill your day with high priority actions inspire you, your epigenetics are working in your hand on behalf of you. So you wanna make sure that you live by priority. This is the best way to get your neuroplasticity and your epigenetics online and to awaken an astronomical vision. So grab that opportunity to grab the astronomical vision. It's complimentary. I'm absolutely certain if you listen to us five or six times, like some people do, it will have an impact on the trajectory of your life. And thank you again for being with me today. Uh, this topic, I could probably go a lot longer on this topic, but at least we got at least some of it in. Um, anyway, I hope it was inspiring for you. Thank you for joining me for this presentation today. If you found value out of the presentation, please go below and please share your comments. We certainly appreciate that feedback. 
and be sure to subscribe and hit the notification icons. That way I can bring more content to you and share more to help you maximize your life. I look forward to our next presentation. Thank you so much for joining.